The people who died in Hojali, the corpses we have seen in Hojali, will be in my heart till I die. They beat and tortured me every day. Every day. The beating was so harsh that I was unable to stand. I wish I would have died in the forest rather than be captured by them. On the night from February 25th to 26th, 1992, Armenian troops attacked the town of Hojali in the Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. 613 Azerbaijani civilians were killed, including over 250 children, women, and the elderly. The Human Rights Watch condemned the mass killing and called it the largest massacre in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Nestled in the mountainous region of Azerbaijan, known as Karabakh, Hojali is remembered by those who lived there as a town with tree-lined streets, a dense forest, and hillsides that echoed the happiness of those who lived beside them. It was a place where Armenians and Azerbaijanis farmed and raised their children, side by side, in peace for centuries. <laughs> I was born and raised in Khojali. Khojali was a very beautiful place. Our daily life was very good. Conditions were good. Cattle raising, vine growing, and tillage were the main agricultural activities in Khojali. We used to farm in our yard. I was married in 1980 and had three children. We had everything we needed, and we were very satisfied with our lives. Yes, we lived together with Armenians. We were friendly with them. We were trading with each other in Kankendi. We were visiting each other's houses. We never had such problems before. The normalcy of life experienced by residents of Hojali would be turned upside down following the collapse of the Soviet Union, to which both Armenia and Azerbaijan belonged. At the end of 1991 and the beginning of 1992, as Azerbaijan was coming out of the Soviet fog and not yet politically and economically stable, Armenia advantageously moved forward with its long-standing plans of invading and annexing Azerbaijan. Armenia mounted a systematic offensive to drive out the Azerbaijani residents of Nagorno-Karabakh and illegally claim the land as their own. Quickly, the conflict turned into a full-blown war. Armenia, with Russian military assistance, invaded Azerbaijan and seized 20% of Azerbaijan's internationally recognized territory. The invasion was followed by brutal ethnic cleansing, resulting in the expulsion of over 800,000 Azerbaijanis from their homes. The ordeal began in November of 1991 when the roads in and out of Hojali were closed. On November 1st, 1991, the road from Hojali to Askaron was completely closed. Thus, all the highways in Hojali were closed. Hojali was completely besieged, and on November 1st, 1991, two Hojali residents were killed. Since all roads were closed, transportation from and to Hojali was impossible. When the bombardment began late on the night of February 25th, 1992, Azerbaijanis who'd been left behind in Hojali after a year of being surrounded were hiding in basements to escape the attack. And uh, when this, the conflict started, like, I didn't understand what's going on, actually, because I was like seven, eight years old kid. I was just trying to understand. First, like, I was like kind of happy that I'm not gonna go to school because, you know, the kids, they, 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 they love to run away from the classes. 
but I was not understanding this, the seriousness of the matter. Because like, my father, we used to have a basement. It was a concrete, it was a good shelter against uh, the rockets. So we, 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 we had a, we exactly knew it when, when they're gonna start shelling, bombing. So at 8, 7 p.m., my father was saying, okay, it's time to go to the basement. That's now they're gonna start bombing. And we actually had like food, blankets, uh, pillows, other necessary things to survive in the basement. In short, we fled and found a shelter in a basement again. Then we saw that they had already entered the town. The Armenians burned the town haystacks and were approaching by putting fire on houses one by one. Those who managed to survive the night made the fateful decision to leave around 3 a.m. When in a hurried panic, the residents of Hojali began fleeing in small groups without proper clothing, some with only what they'd been wearing at night. They escaped into the dark and cold February night. We were 500 people in the group. Majority of the people, babies, children, were frozen to death. Today, I cannot endure visualizing all of this. A baby was frozen to death before the eyes of his mother. Nobody could help him. There were eight of us when we fled to escape. We lived in Hojali in the upper village. Our communication junction was located in the lower village. Till we reached there, we passed over hundreds of dead bodies. It was like fire falling from the sky. There were dead bodies and wounded people all around us. We could hear people shouting and moaning everywhere. We could hardly climb to Ketek Mountain because of the snow. It was getting bright at that time. We saw that Hojali was burning. Skirmishes, smoke, fire. We could see it from there. They, Armenians, fired at us with artillery while we were trying to escape through the forest. Some were killed at that moment, then we climbed the hills with the survivors. We stayed nine nights in the frosty forest. Our hands and feet were frozen. We were left without water in the forest, and everyone was starving. <laughs> Gelendim. Tesellim alırım. 
Zengin de bak bile çekmişler gelen de bak tesellim ondan alacağım ben kadar. While trying to flee, many Azerbaijani civilians were ambushed and killed in open fields by Armenian troops. Among the killed were 63 children, 106 women, and 70 elderly. Armenians came and took us hostages. We were afraid to respond. They were beating us. They were pulling from our hair and hitting our head to the wall. They threw me against the wall and because of the impact my teeth were broken, my ear bled and my eyes became dark so I could not see. I was not able to speak. I was in a very bad condition at that time. My three-day-old baby died there. Ancak bir gün beni o kadar vurdular ki, o kadar dövdüler ki, özümden geçmişim. Bir vaxt ay gözlerimi açtım. Baktım ki, gözüm açılmırdı. Elimin suyunu vurdum, gözlerimi açtım. Ben gözlerimi açtım. Xeyli, çok çetinlikle, çok çetinlikle. Ve gözlerimi açtım ki, her yer karanlıydı, her yer zulmetliydi. Onda hiss edildim ki, ben bayırdayım, hayatdayım. Bedenim o kadar dövülüb ki, hem de soyuqdan bedenim keyleşib, hiss edemirim. Hiç ne hiss edemirim. Elimi yanağıma vururam, hiss edemirim. Gözümü saçıma vururam, hiss edemirim. Hiç ne bilmirim. Kışkırdım ki, kimse var burada, kimse var burada dedim. Bir koca ermeni geldi, koca ermeni geldi, o Azerbaycan dilinde onlar danışırdılar. O mene dedi, aa hala sen ölmemişsin dedi. O benim saçım var idi, uzun saçım var idi. O tuttu saçımdan beni, haradası 12-13 metr sürüdü, apardı. Ben bir zaman ayıldım ki, benim paltarım yoktu. Tam lüt vəziyyətindeyim. The violence committed against the people in town of Hojali was no accident, nor was it an exchange of fire between two groups of armed combatants on a battlefield. Mass murder and excessive force were employed as tools of intimidation and demoralization against the Azerbaijani civilian population of Karabakh. The current president of Armenia, Serge Sargsyan, was the military commander of the Armenian forces in Nagorno-Karabakh throughout 1992, the time and place of the Hojali massacre. While serving as Armenia's defense minister in 2001, Sargsyan was infamously quoted by Thomas DeWall, a British author and journalist who is one of the most preeminent experts of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, as saying, Before Hojali, the Azerbaijanis thought that they were joking with us. They thought that the Armenians were people who could not raise their hand against the civilian population. We need to put a stop to all that, and that's what happened. President Sargsyan indicated that the depths of brutality against civilians were purposeful and meant to engender deep and lasting fear in the people of Azerbaijan, approving the deadly serious goal of defeating Azerbaijan. By 1994, Armenian troops supported by the Russian army had managed to carve out Nagorno-Karabakh itself, plus uh, a number of provinces of Azerbaijan that surrounded Karabakh uh, and ripped it away from uh, Azerbaijan. On that day, I accidentally chose that route. I was flying by the hillside because, in that case, the helicopter is less visible and those areas are usually less populated. On the left side of the hillside, on the route to Azgaran, we saw very strange things, something, uh, a lot of colorful things on the ground. I think that there were at least 300 to 500 corpses of people because that path of death was too long. I still see that picture. The path was at least 300 to 700 meters or maybe one kilometer, not less. They died while they were walking in rows. Of course it was hard to separate, but there were children also among them. We could see small corpses as well. Every time when such assaults happened, they would let children and women go, but this time they didn't. Why? I don't know. Maybe something went wrong or this was a pre-planned action against civilians. The people could not make it to Agdam. They just had to cross the hill and the other side was Agdam and they would have been safe. But they installed the machine guns in such a perfect way that everyone was in a trap and they killed everyone. 
So we know that they accounted for 600 or so dead because they got the bodies and they did uh, 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 autopsies, which are, um, you know, they did in Agdam. They took the bodies down there. But we have lots of eyewitness testimony to the dead bodies on the hillside there. Uh, that by the time that, that Westerners got there the following day, uh, the bodies were frozen. Although the tragic event happened 25 years ago in a small country in the Caucasus Mountains, many in the international community have recognized the massacre and condemned the perpetrators responsible. So when I learned about it, it's one thing, terrible atrocities are committed in the, in, in the course of war. But with Khojali, um, it's been said over and over again, the, the sheer barbarity of the actions. I don't know a human being alive. I, I'm often asked to comment on this. And of course, I mean, of course one condemns it. But when you think about it, it's uh, in addition to the human toll, it's a culture, a vibrant culture was cut off and was then uprooted, at best uprooted. The European Court of Human Rights also confirmed the facts about the tragedy. In its ruling of April 22, 2010, the court said, it appears that the reports available from independent sources indicate that at the time of the capture of Hojali, on the night of 25 to 26 February 1992, hundreds of civilians of Azerbaijani ethnic origin were reportedly killed, wounded, or taken hostage during their attempt to flee the captured town by Armenian fighters attacking the town, who were reportedly assisted by the 366th Motorized Rifle Regiment. Ryan Zinke, a representative from Montana, was the first U.S. congressman to speak on the Hojali massacre on the floor of Congress. Mr. Speaker, I rise to remember the 23rd anniversary of the Conjoli tragedy, which took place on February 25th and 26th of 1992. On this evening, 23 years ago, it was the site of a cowardly massacre of 613 unarmed Azerbaijan citizens, which included 106 women, 63 children, and 70 elderly. Despite the attempts to minimize this tragedy, I stand in memory with the Azerbaijan caucus to remember the loss. The United States and Azerbaijan share a bipartisan and a strong relationship. As a former commander of the Navy SEALs, I know firsthand the importance of Azerbaijan's commitment. Aside from deploying troops and equipment to Afghanistan, over one-third of non-lethal aid that was used by our troops in Afghanistan flowed through Azerbaijan. President Kennedy once said that America would pay any price and, in, and bear any burden in the defense of liberty. I'm proud that Azerbaijan and America share the same commitment to freedom and liberty. It's important today that we take this moment to join our Azerbaijan allies in liberty and recognizing the Kojoli tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. Twenty U.S. states have also passed either resolutions or issued proclamations on the massacre. A number of countries from Mexico to Peru to Bosnia-Herzegovina have also adopted legislations condemning the Hojali tragedy and honoring its victims. The Justice for Hojali campaign, led by Leila Alieva, has been active in informing the international community about the Hojali tragedy since 2008 through a variety of events and publications. It's like many countries around the world, and there are many. There is a dominant force that comes in, uh, is aggressive, uh, commits atrocities, and somehow the world allows them to get away with that. And there are a variety of reasons for it. I think that Azerbaijan is one of those countries that has had, uh, in this case, of course, land taken from it. People were murdered and, and in the streets and mutilated, and uh, histories were destroyed, and the world watched. No one, I think, unless their interests are very selfish, would agree that it was the right thing to have innocent people, men, women, children, murdered, mutilated, their property taken, and have a million people exiled from what is, was their homeland and still should be. I don't think anyone thinks that's a good thing. The question is, I suppose, what do you do about it? And, and as I, I look at uh, you know, what, what happened in, in that little village, 
You know, where were those good people? Where were those good souls that uh, that said, you know, here's here's my house. You can have a refuge in my house. And and as a Christian, that is the message of my Savior, to do unto others, as I would have them do unto me. You know, what I want, the good that I want for you, is the good that I want for myself. The good that I want for myself is the good that I want for you. And I cannot preach from this book if I don't live what's in this book. <laughs> because we preach with our actions, not with our words. Words without actions is empty. And that's what the Bible says. The faith without works is no faith. Despite the unimaginable horrors of Hojli and the continued occupation, and the hundreds of thousands of people displaced by the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, Azerbaijan has maintained its century-old tradition of interfaith tolerance and harmony. It's, it's amazing, really, uh, and I'm, I'm very impressed with their leadership, with the, you know, the, the thoughtfulness of their approaches on many things. Um, they have a you know, not that I'm an expert on foreign policy or anything, but I know how to get along with people, and I think they're doing a magnificent job. They're really, they really are the prototype for what could be certainly a solution in the Middle East. You know, if, if people, if, 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 if nations would adopt some of the things that they've adopted, the world would be a better place, no question. You look at the globe, the globe, and look at the countries that are predominantly Muslim countries and its leadership, you got to ask yourself one important question. How are the minorities treated? Are they safe? Uh, the minorities of any country is the consciousness of the nation. So my affinity to Azerbaijan is that here's a country that comes from its rocky history of the bigger Russia and communism and all that history. But at the same time, it has to try to forget its past, its pain of yesterday, and try to reconcile and move forward, and at the same time, give every citizen in their country dignity. I have been in many countries. I would recommend to all nations to learn the model of multiculturalism and tolerance from Azerbaijan that has existed here for centuries. The multiculturalism is a wealth of Azerbaijan. Neither oil, nor agriculture, nor other economic issues can raise Azerbaijan, if not its multiculturalism. The mixture of culture, blood, and religion shows the enormous potential Azerbaijan has for development. It says a lot about a society and a government that allows people to basically, members of minority religious faiths, to function. And when you talk about here a, a society that's 95% plus Muslim majority, and uh, I have since visited with you know Christian leaders and in churches and spent some time in um, uh, you know different uh, Jewish settings. You know, it just seems quite natural for everyone. The war of over 20 years ago didn't end in peace. There's just a stalemate. And the international community has not been able to solve this terrible problem. Uh, much land that belonged to Azerbaijan is now occupied by Armenia. And nobody seems to want to get involved. Well, that's really too bad because it's an injustice which is on the radar. You know, it is a myth that Azerbaijanis are enemies of Armenians. 
Most of the Armenians have good relations with Azerbaijanis outside Armenia. Because we had no real reason to quarrel with each other, the real story is being hidden in Armenia. What is being told is that this conflict is about liberation of Nagorno-Karabakh. The Armenian government does its best not even to mention the name Hojali. It is a big stain on the conscience of the Armenian people. Both Azerbaijani and Armenian people need the perpetrators of this tragedy to be prosecuted in the Hague Tribunal. You can hit a man or hurt him and say sorry, that's normal, and you may be forgiven. But you cannot do something like that, Kojali massacre, and then be forgiven. It is unforgivable. For this kind of crime, one must be prosecuted. I cannot say in one word how to resolve this conflict. We, as simple people of Armenia and Azerbaijan, who have the real power to solve this conflict, must understand each other. Only us, not the politicians or any peacekeeping missions. Today, if Armenians will stand up, and state that we don't want Nagorno-Karabakh, and we want peace with Azerbaijan, and the same thing is done in Azerbaijan, then everything can change. Right now, those... Nobody is, can bring me my childhood back, nobody. My, my childhood is lost, it's gone. My younger age class is just gone, lost. So those, those nobody is gonna, no, it's impossible to recompensate materially or spiritually what we have lived through in the past. But right now, those, all those people will be lost in the war we even lost their graves. We couldn't. We can't even go and lay flower or red on their graves. Right now, the biggest concern we will have is to return to our homeland, Hojali, which is still under occupation since 1992. So, my message will be that I don't want to leave as a refugee till end of my life. I don't want to bear this name. So I want just to return to the city I was born 34 years ago. And I want to live in Kojala. I wish no child in the world would ever see war. I do not wish war on any country in the world. I wish all the war in the world would be over. May God have mercy on all the children in the world. May war never happen again. This is my wish for all nations and all countries, and also for my people. My father, my grandfather, my other relatives' graves are all there. I miss and yearn for my land. I want to go back and smell my father's grave. I have been yearning and suffering for 23 years. I want to see the place I was born and raised.
Çok itirdik. Çok azap gördük. Eybi yok muharbede. Muharbede her şey olur. Şehit de olur. Yaralı da olur. Elil de olur. Ama bugünden sonra olmasın da gördük. Dansa bilmiyorum.